We ask that you be with us today and that your Holy Spirit be with Mark today as he brings us his message, that you be with us to gain in wisdom and understanding of the truth that he'll be sharing with us. And we ask that all we do today be to praise you and glorify your name. And we pray this in the name of your beloved Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Well, be seated. <laughs> Can you believe it's November 1st already? You'll know it tonight about 5.05 when the sun is set. I can't believe it. Um, there's been a lot of changes this year. Uh, COVID-19 has changed the way we do things and the way things are done. And one of the things notably in our church service that we have changed is we no longer pass an offering plate. Um, we have a box at the table in the back, a place for you to put your offering. We also have uh, a PayPal account, and if you have PayPal, you can pay, uh, uh, use that to uh, give a gift to the church. And then there's a, uh, another way that some people are using, it, uh, just like you pay bills through your bank, you can set up or make a car payment or something like that. You can set up that you can make a payment to church in the very same way. And part of the reason I bring that to your attention right now, uh, I, I would assume that the COVID-19 has something to do with it, but in our bulletin today, you'll notice a financial update. Uh, it shows September and October's uh, giving. And our financial year started in September. So this is giving year to date for our church. And currently, we're uh, over $16,000 below our expenses. And that's an averaging about $8,000 a month. Uh, I don't know if that's the new normal, or if it is, uh, our budget uh, about $100,000 too much this year. And uh, we'll have to make some adjustments. But if, hopefully, it's maybe just the changes that we're facing with COVID that's affecting that. So I wanted to bring that to your attention today uh, so that you're aware of our financial situation. Thank you. And good morning. Uh, good morning. Just a, a couple of announcements. Uh, we have bulletins again. So uh, look through those. We'll give you some information, not just about what Rick was talking about, the numbers are in there, but about Children's Church and the, uh, the shoebox that are going on. And um, here's just a few more uh, for me. Uh, last week, uh, many of you know that we, we had a chili fundraiser, and, and the generosity um, was kind of off the chart. And it was just amazingly uh, loving uh, outpouring of, of love to the youth, but also of money. Um, thank you very much for that. What kind of hurt a little bit is that some of you went away without getting chili. Some gave money and didn't take any, some didn't want any, some wanted some but got there too late. So um, we fixed that. We, we made, made another small batch of chili and uh, it's going to be on the same table. So this is how, basically how it's going to work. If you uh, donated money last week but didn't get chili, this is your time to get some. If you got to the table too late and desperately wanted chili and you're out, you're second in line. If you got chili last week and loved it so much that you want to donate more and have more chili, you're third in line. So um, hopefully uh, everybody who, who wanted some last week didn't get any is going to be a chance to, to get it. It's the same basic recipe and it, it's just a little bit less than last week. So it's kind of a stopgap measure. Just to say thank you for your generosity. And um, you know what, chili is easy to make and quite enjoyable to do. So this is something that, that we can do make sure that, oh, and, and uh, it was really good. We, we did have um, Emeril Lagasse and, and Guy Fieri were looking for the recipes. They almost came to blows, so that's how good it was. Um, also on, on the youth group front is after, after 
of the, the, the turmoil and the things going left side and crazy for the last however many months, um, we're about ready, in fact we are ready to, to start a, a unique senior high uh, ministry night of Bible study, of fellowship, uh, of fun and a little bit of craziness. So uh, next week on the 8th, Sunday night, um, we're going to be joining each other, uh, high school age, that's freshman through um, go 12th grade. And uh, for a night uh, on Sunday nights from 6 to 7, 7.30, depending on how things go. And um, it's going to be a really amazing time to have an older group of kids get together for Bible study and for fellowship. So if you are a high schooler or no one, um, sorry if you feel like a high schooler but you're, you're you know, 79, sorry, maybe you can come help. But you know what, we won't expect you to, to uh, play the, the games or do some of the silliness, but um, we're always looking for involvement in youth ministry on that side. But um, high schoolers, it's, it's a glory to God that we actually have high schoolers that we can actually encourage to come and have a separate time of their own. So, next Sunday at um, 6 o'clock, downstairs in the youth room, drive around the back side of the building and come into the youth room. So. Um, on to important things like pastoral prayers. Father God, we are thankful that in a shutdown or a half shutdown or in limited congregation in limited numbers, that you're still working amazing things in people's lives just as powerfully, just as intensely, just as lovingly as you always have. Our, our separation doesn't deter you. The things that, that keep us from gathering together does not slow you down. Father, we thank you. Holy Spirit, your power has been more and more um, evident as you work in people's lives to keep them connected. We ask that you continue to keep us connected with every means possible from writing letters and snail mail to emails to Zoom in any electronic way possible. We thank you that we still feel your, your presence in our lives and our hearts, even though we are still a little bit um, socially distanced. There is no social distance from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, as we continue to build into each other's lives and serve you in this church, let us remember to be careful of doing things that slow the spread and keep us from infecting ourselves or others. Help us to be mindful that some people have um, different sensibilities and, and comfort zones as we meet and continue to meet. But Father, most important, help us to not be fearful as we kind of look at things, as we look at how we live our lives. We want to be careful, and we want to be mindful, but we don't want to be fearful. And we know that your perfect love casts out fear. Father, we ask you to be with us the rest of this service and the rest of this day in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Tom. Morning, everybody. Morning. Morning. Um, you might wonder first why Heidi is up here. The poor girl rolled her ankle coming in to sing this morning. And normally she's not in a wheelchair, but... She had the courage to still get up here and sing as a little shout out for Heidi. <laughs> Although the, the sad part is she's going to be trapped up here with me <laughs> the whole time on the platform. But uh, what, a, what a gal. Yeah. Um, also want to say a welcome to my sister who's here, Marianne Dwyer, and her husband, Tom Dwyer. Thank you. Thank you. Me up here. <laughs> Oops. Ooh. Okay. Let's just assume that everything's okay now. <laughs> uh, I want to mention also a couple of things that I have been in terms of sort of news, weather, and sports. Um, first, you do have your COVID guidelines, so just a reminder that uh, the church is following policy and also, um, you know, we have this exit by the door in the front. If you'd like to come out the front door and stay away from the, the sort of crowded lobby situation, it gets 
gets uh, congested back there sometimes. And um, also, you know, what I'm uh, starting a new series next week on prayer. And uh, we're going to have a prayer meeting, actually, tomorrow and also on Wednesday. There's a handout that will help you to follow along with what we're going to do at that prayer meeting. There's some of you took copies last week. Every one of them went, in fact, and there's more now. So if you want to be part of that group, there's one group that will meet in the morning, tomorrow at 3 in the afternoon, I'm sorry, and then also Wednesday at 7 at night. So if you're an early day person, you can come to the 3 o'clock. We're giving you an option then of a evening one on the on the Wednesday. And, of course, this sandwich is the election, right? which is Tuesday. So it's good for church to be praying before, during, it, and also after, but I put those two meetings for that purpose. And then after interviewing people that come to those two, we may pick one prayer time that makes the most sense for everybody, but you'll hear more about that in the coming days. I just want to give you options so we pray more for the church, for our country, for virus issues, and, and etc. because prayer is a powerful thing. God answers it. And uh, we're going to be having more information on prayer. Next slide. Go ahead, Tom. We're going to start a series in, in two weeks um, dealing with prayer because so often we feel like we fail in that and we don't do well. And so I, I'm calling it prayer. You can do this. And we'll just take three or four weeks and, and, and drill down a little bit in the Bible, see what it says. So strengthen your prayer life. Maybe you have a good prayer life. You want to make it a little better. And uh, whatever your situation is with God in terms of you communicating with Him, it can always be a little bit better. Amen? Amen. All right. So um, those are things that we're going to be looking at. We all struggle with prayer. Uh, everyone does. And uh, we can explore and learn from those things together. Okay. A lot of things going on, some that aren't so good. You know, today was daylight saving time. How many of you, you know, got here early because you forgot your clock. No, most of you had it. That's good. But we also got the virus going on. We got the elections coming. And uh, how many of you already voted? Put your hand up. Wow. A vast majority. That's good. So you've already spoken in terms of national issues. And everyone's a little tense about this whole thing. So I think you need a little bit of comic relief. All right? I like to have a little humor sometimes when we start out. So these aren't very good, but they're uh, they do go with the, the theme, so you know we're in these B um, concepts here with everything is B. We begin with God believed on behavior. And I thought of a couple of B jokes. So they're not very good, but they, we'll start off with these. You know, you've probably already heard these about the guy that goes into a, a, um, a honeybee store and he wants to buy a dozen honeybees. And so he pays for the bees and the guy gives him 13. And he says, well, I only paid for 12. Why would you give me 13? He said, well, that's a freebie. <laughs> I told you they weren't very good. <laughs> and then, you know, the last one, just to, because I don't want to put you through too much pain. What did the mama bullet say to the papa bullet? We're going to have a BB. <laughs> oh, okay. So, <laughs> some of you are a little late on that one. Anyway, we've been going through these five B's, um, letter B, not B, honey B, and we're at the uh, fourth one today. And just in a little bit of a recap, we talked first about how God begins with us. He awakens us. We don't even really know sometimes that God is doing this work, but he's active, working in our events, circumstances, relationships, because he loves us to draw him to himself. And then, of course, we talked also about belief, the difference between believing and really having faith in God. A lot of people believe in God, but they don't put their faith in Him. So a true belief, like Indiana Jones had to step out and take that step of faith. We use that little film clip there. And so hopefully most of you have taken that step just from believing to really having faith in God. And then last week we talked about belonging, the, the, what it means to feel like you're part of a community and the commitment that's related to that. And uh, these are all on YouTube, and you can resource those if you missed any of them. But today we'll be talking about this, um, the fourth B, and then next week we'll finish this up. But today we're talking about behavior. Because your, your actions and your attitude are your behavior, right? It's what you do. 
you, you behave because of what you believe. Did you hear that? Your beliefs are going to be shown out in your behavior. That happened this morning when you got up. You ate some food, you believed it was safe, and so you ate it. You didn't probably think too much about it. <clears throat> you got in your car because you trust your car, and it got you here safely, hopefully. Um, you cross the parking lot hoping that there wouldn't be egg corns, and you know you can't always have things going your way. Poor Heidi. But uh, you know what I'm saying? And you chose a candidate because you believe in that one, and so you voted. And you believed you wouldn't get the virus, so you came to church today. These are just beliefs, and it shows up in your, in your behavior. You know that most people won't wear red because they don't believe they'll look good in red. And so our behaviors sort of, our, our, belief, our, our behaviors are driven by our beliefs. You know, on the negative, it's true also if you, if you believe you're going to get in trouble and you speed, well, then you don't speed, although we have the urge to do that, don't we, sometimes? Yeah. And so uh, sometimes we, we actually believe that bad things are something that we should do, and we do bad things sometimes, like the picture you see up on the screen. We may even like it, uh, like the next line here, you know, it was totally worth it. <laughs> Kid's standing in the corner, and he's paying a price, but to him, because he believed what he would be doing would be fun, you know, he did it. But that can catch up with you, can't it? And uh, sometimes things that we do privately or just in the chat room or something ends up on Facebook, and then everybody knows, and, you know, the world has changed in those things. Everybody knows everything, every brother or sister or mom or dad did. Actually, I have a sister here today, and she would gladly testify to all the bad things I did when I was a kid. If my mom didn't catch it, one of my five sisters surely did. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that the things that we believe in eventually show up in our behavior. And that can actually become a negative spiral going down the other way, because I showed you how the five Bs go up closer and closer in a relationship with God. But here's how we can begin and believe the wrong things, belong to the wrong groups, behave the wrong way, become the wrong kind of person. It can be a downward negative as well as an upward. And where are you in your life in that? And we come to church each week to remind ourselves of what's good and what's right and what's true. And it helps us stay, hopefully, on the, on the upward cycle. As I said last week, you can be running from God sitting right here in church. And so I'm going to test your beliefs today as they relate to your behavior. <clears throat> because behavior, that's where your Christianity is going to show up. People are going to see it in your faith and in your choices. And actions speak louder than words, right? The old statement goes, you know, your actions speak so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. Because some people say one thing, but their actions are so the other way that they lose credibility. All right, if you've got an outline, pull it out. You can jot down the first, my first thought today, which is this. Behave doesn't save. Behave does not save. <clears throat> now, good behavior is good enough sometimes. You're at school, you've got teachers, you're in the military, you've got good behavior, you want to get out of jail early, good behavior works for all those things, right? And so we cooperate with the schools, with the, you know, wearing our masks the way we should, with the highway patrol when we're going down the road, you know, you tap your brakes a little or something. <laughs> Why? Because we know we're going to get slapped, we're going to get scolded, we will get penalized if we don't behave. And so we think behaving makes us good enough. And sometimes I've seen people project that up into heaven, thinking that because I behave well, that's going to get me into heaven. But you know what? Behave doesn't save. And this mentality goes on deep sometimes inside people. You know, I, I tried so hard in my life, and surely God will understand. And so we measure our salvation or our eternal life by how we feel, and we assume things. Those are dangerous assumptions to make. Because, you know, the majority of people want to go to heaven, don't they? USA Today had a uh, survey not long ago. They were asking the 1%, you know, the top-level American income earners, what they would pay. 
Those people would pay over $400,000 if they could have super brain power and know everything. They would pay more than that to have true love, four eighty-seven. dollars But they would pay the most if it could guarantee a place for them in heaven. Showing that people value heaven. Now that's just the 1%, but it's probably also a cross-section of, of every age and income group. It just says that people value heaven more than anything else, and a lot of them think they're already in just because of their behavior. A pop culture star, I'm not going to tell you who it was, but they say this, I should go to heaven, otherwise it wouldn't be fair. I haven't done anything wrong. My conscience is very clean. My soul is white and pure. I should go straight, straight to heaven. Who said that? Well, it's not really important. Most people believe that. <clears throat> you got an outline in front of you. You can fill in this little blank. 80% of people think that they're going to go to heaven. Only 2%, I didn't give you this to fill in the blank, but only 2% people actually believe that they're going to be in hell. <clears throat> Why? Because we compare ourselves to other people. Now, there's some people that just don't want to go to heaven. Oscar Wilde said, I don't want to go to heaven. None of my friends are there. <laughs> kind of a grim thing to say. Of course, Oscar Wilde had some weird quotes. He had some funny, some, some pretty good ones. Actually, his, his final words, his last words before he died, this is sort of kind of funny. Um, he was in a cheap hotel room. You can check this out. And it was badly decorated and stuff. And he was just about to die. And he looked at the wallpaper and he said, Either that wallpaper goes, or I do, and he died. <laughs> he was a strange sort of character. <laughs> anyway, people think that if they're good enough, and they do enough good things, they're going to get a spot in heaven. A lot of times, it's because we compare ourselves to our neighbor, or to other Americans, or things we've heard in the news or something. And that's very dangerous, because good is not good enough for God. Let me give you this. You've seen this with the four spiritual laws. None of us are good enough to get across. But how about a visual? You know, you're at the Grand Canyon with your best friend. You're saying, I could jump over the Grand Canyon. Well, nobody actually could. But you might say, I can jump farther than you out to get toward the other side. It's nine miles across the Grand Canyon. Okay? It's 47,500 47, feet or something. Yeah. So I can jump 20 feet, and I go down. And you're stronger. You jump 40 feet. Well, we're still, we're both way, way short, right? And that's kind of what it's like thinking I'm going to get into heaven, even though my neighbor might not. Because, you know, I think I'm better than him. Or, you know, I could drown in six inches of water. You drown in 60 feet. Well, so what? We both drown. That's kind of the way God looks at our sin. It's a giant disqualifier, and so behave does not save. All sin really points to, um, you know, the condemnation that we deserve. And so some people, they, they hear this and they go, why should, I, why should I behave? What difference does it make? And there's lots of people that wonder that, and so they just give up. Because they get confused about what God wants. They think they'll never reach it. They hear the... The, the repent, the condemnation, but they don't hear the good news. So let's take a minute and sort of hit the pause button and, and look at the second point because it looks behind your, your behavior. Look behind your behavior. That's point two if you're taking notes with us this morning. And if you've got a Bible, you can turn to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. And I hope you brought your Bible today. It's not really... Uh, correct for us to leave um, Bibles in the pews right now, but bringing a Bible to church is valuable and important. Hold up your phone or your Bible if you brought one today. Come on. Pastors love to see this, and we love to hear, you know, pages turning, people going in their Bible to the right place to show that they're connected and they're staying with you, and they came here to really learn something. We'll look at Psalm 51 in just a minute, but remember... Good people don't get into heaven. Forgiven people get into heaven. We find our forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And our behavior alone doesn't save. But it's still important to behave, right? 
So let's look behind your behavior and see what's there. Because the problem is that we're born with this flaw. We all have this nature that comes to us. We're sort of dead from the start. And Psalm 51, I think, um, speaks to this because David is talking about his own life. He's feeling pain because of uh, terrible sins that he committed. But he really is capturing some things on human nature here. I'm going to start at verse 1, but I'm going to skip down. Stay with me. Verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion. Blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Verse 4. Against you and you alone have I sinned. Now skip down to verse 5. Here's the kicker. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. So David, who is considered to be a friend of God, says, here, here, it was there at my birth. I inherited this from my mother. And, and we've all had it. It goes all the way back down to Adam. And so we can't be qualified to be good enough for God because of the sin nature we were born with. Some groups don't believe this. But in theology, it's called federal headship. Um, let me explain it to you in simple terms. Let's say we're all on a ship and we're crossing the Atlantic, and we're heading for the, 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 uh, the iceberg, and you can call the ship Titanic if you want to, and the whole human race is on this boat, and Adam is running the boat, and because of his laziness or selfishness or whatever, bam, he strikes the iceberg, the boat goes down, he dies, but we all die. It wasn't our fault, but because of what he did, we get stuck with it. That's federal headship. And that's the, the, the nature that we were born with. And we like to say, well, it's just a baby. Now, I've heard babies make a lot of noise, be very selfish, and a lot of trouble. <laughs> it, it's traceable back to the early days of our life. And it's because of the nature. The Bible is, says that it's because of the nature that we were born with. Now, I've said it before. It's on the screen. You can't expect unbelievers to act like believers until they are believers. And, and Christians are simply, uh, we just recognize that we need a Savior. And yet we're still sinners, even though we have Christ as our Savior. So, um, you know, in your outline, look there, there's a verse that I have underlined. It starts, as the scriptures say. Let's read that together. Ready? Here we go. As the scriptures say, come on, no one is good. No one in all the world is innocent. No one has ever really followed God's paths or even truly wanted to. Everyone has turned away. All have gone wrong. No one anywhere has kept on doing what is right. Not one. Now, I took this from the Living Bible. You can check it out in the Amplified or in the Interlinear or any other version. It's all going to say essentially the same thing. And what it says is that we just don't have, we just don't have it in us to be obedient to God. And it's not just our deeds or our behavior. It's in our nature. It's a human nature which is driven by the flesh. We have these urges to please ourselves. We want to be happy without God, even though it's impossible. And so people will do everything they can think of, except actually go to God. Isaiah chapter 59 says this, in verse 1, Listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you. His ear is not too deaf to hear you call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he's turned away. And so, good on the Bible, because the Bible tells us what the problem is. It says, it's not God's problem, it's our problem. We're the ones that have cut ourselves off from Him. And of course, this goes back to the fact that He gave us free choice. And we can choose to say, God, I love you, or God, I hate you, or God, I couldn't care less about you. But He doesn't stop loving us. He just keeps tracking with us. And, and putting opportunities in front of us, waiting for our choices to change. But he's not going to make you choose him. Choose this day whom you will serve. 
It says in, in Joshua. You know, last week we were looking at Ephesians 1, or Ephesians 2. And uh, I'm not going to turn to it now, but it was saying that, you know, we're the sons of disobedience. We've been following the ways of the devil, who is the ruler of this world. Even if people don't know that they're following, because there's only two forces in the universe. There's God's way, and then there's the other side. And you're, you, you're choosing, you're making many choices every day, which side you're living for. But Ephesians 2 said that we, we lived that way. And we didn't even understand ourselves. And we couldn't stop it. We were talking about Romans 7 where Paul says, the thing I want to do, I can't do. And the thing I try to stop from doing, I can't stop myself from doing it. And even for Christians who have Jesus Christ right inside of us, we still have these urges to do what's wrong. I know I do. And if you were honest with me, you would say that you do. And we'll get to, in a few minutes, the solution for how we stay close to him. But the evil is right there with us. So we have this capacity to sin. But we also have a capacity for guilt. And a capacity for guilt is, is, you know, we know when we've done something wrong. And many times we hide it or we suppress it. And interestingly enough, even animals have this, uh, this uh, knowledge when they've done something wrong. I got a little video we're going to show you now. It's two minutes. And it just shows dogs and how they how they can express their guilt sometimes. What did you do to this tissue? Dummy? What did you do? What did you do? What? Did you chew this up? Instead of the spirit, they have instinct. 
God just programmed them. He wired them for cycles and for migration, all that. They glorify God by, by doing it, but they still have mind, emotion. If you don't believe this, you take a stick and poke it into a hornet's nest. And the hornets have a mind to figure out who poked it and emotions to share their anger at what happened and a will to go get that person who did it. So, you know, all these creatures have this, and I think the dogs, in just a funny way, illustrate the fact that we all have this guilty component, right? And you felt that sometimes just like those dogs did in the video. And sometimes the, our guilt is over terrible, terrible sins that we feel. Uh, and, and maybe we've hurt a lot of people in doing those things. And I've had people sitting across from my desk in my office here at other churches explaining, I can't get past what happened, and I, I, I don't want to bury it, and I have to get it out. And so they need to talk about it. But other times it's smaller things, you know, like criticism or resentment or you, know, you being impatient or selfish or lazy or something like that. And if I had x-ray vision right now and I could look in all of your brains, <laughs> I bet I would have got you on one of those that I just read. Laziness, resentment, impatience, whatever. Because it's just, you know, it's just, it's just where life is. Life is messy. The problem is those sins still count against you. Even though they're small. And that's why we can't compare. Because it's still bad behavior. Now, there's different consequences, of course, for different sins. If you're driving 56 in a 50-mile zone, well, that's one that's different than killing somebody, right? But there's, there's still sins, but there are different consequences for different sins. And the problem is we tend to compare ourselves. And now we're back at the Grand Canyon, where I can jump a little farther than you, but still none of us are going to get over. And these are some things that the Bible says you know, about behavior. All right, if you got a Bible, again, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And while you're turning there, I want you to think about the Civil War. Because the Civil War was a horrible event in, in American history. And the problem in the Civil War was that, uh, you know, it was... It was like a giant tug of war, one side against another. But the destructive thing about a civil war is that it's internal. There's no conquest for another nation. There's no chance to gather property or something. It's just inside a country, and it destroys itself. We've seen this in countries in Asia and in Africa, even in Europe, where there was a civil war, and it was so painful to the country's history. And the problem with civil war is there's two very deep, Deep beliefs. In the U.S., the South and the North both had beliefs so strong that they were willing to die by the hundreds of thousands. You know, we actually feel a little bit of this in the United States right now. The politics are so polemic that there's demonstrations, there's strong feelings of the election. You could just feel the anxiety and the tension and the we're right and we're better than you or, or whatever. And you know, it, it just goes to extremes. But the, my, my point here is that sometimes there's a civil war in your head. And you get into a civil war against yourself. And it's destructive just like a civil war because you're, you're sort of tearing yourself down. And so what I want to do in this section is look behind your behavior. What is that conflict that goes inside of us that's so destructive? And, and as I mentioned before, you know, you've got mind, emotion, and will in the middle of your heart. Bible, when it says soul, it's also referring to your heart. And you get your spirit where Christ comes to live inside you. He, his spirit comes into your spirit. And when you say yes to God and you keep this sort of little gate open, then he can, the Holy Spirit can freely flow into your emotions and your mind and your will and calm you down and, and give you positive thoughts and start to help you develop, you know, habits and behaviors in your will that are, that are productive and that are good and that are Christ-like. And, and we, we have to give him permission to come in. And if we close that, it's called grieving the spirit. We'll get back to that in a minute. I mentioned that last week also. But uh, the point is that, you know, we have this war and this struggle going on inside of us. And that's, this is the battleground right here. Our mind and emotions and will. 
And so Satan attacks us in those areas through our feelings and through our choices and through our thoughts. And Jesus Christ, when he comes to live in our heart, he changes our beliefs, the things that we believe about ourselves and about the world. And so it, it, for him, it's not about self-improvement. It's not about redoing something, uh, you know, in your own head. It's a transformation. It's a, it's a new nature inside of you. And now in 2 Corinthians, let me read in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. You've seen these verses before, starting at verse uh, 17. That means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a, a new person. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. He's saying that a new life has begun there. Now, the, the word for new there is kainos. Uh, I mentioned this when I was preaching here in the summer. Kainos is an interesting word. Um, it's not something new like um, you remodel your kitchen and then it's new, or a rebuilt motor, or a rebuilt army, or you rebuild your career. It's not like that. This is a new of something that has never existed before. It's completely original. That's what he means when he says new, a new nature. This is not just remodeling your soul. There's something completely different about it now. And a new, a new nature is with you because a new person has come to live inside of you. It's Jesus Christ. And that's why I've put in your insert several times in the past month or so, this list. I don't have it as an insert today. But it says who we are in Christ. You know, God's saying to us, Mark, you know, the blank is where you fill your blank. In. You're my child. I've always loved you. You're a gift to me, Mark. I know you're going to face things. I'm with you today, farther down. Mark, life is messy. We'll face it together. These are what the verses in the Bible tell us about our nature. And I put it up there again and again because you, it, it needs to be drilled in. It's that important. Actually, it, it's, it's good news in many ways. Romans chapter 4, I don't turn to it, but it... <clears throat> Um, Paul is saying the same thing again. He's saying people are counted through Christ as righteous, not because of their work, but because of faith in God who forgives sinners. David spoke of this when he described this happiness of those who declare righteousness without working for it. Quote, and this is from Psalm 32. Oh, the joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. And so this new nature takes effect when we keep this, when we keep the gate open that I was showing there. And so we're, we're looking behind our behavior here at how Christ transforms um, our nature and our, and our beliefs. Because we, we can't save ourselves. We need God to do that. You're never going to jump over the Grand Canyon. And there's only one way to God. And it's through Jesus Christ. And people say, well, why did God only create one way? Why is there only one way? There should be many ways to get to heaven. The Bible says there's only one way. It's in Jesus. Let's go back to the Grand Canyon for a second. Let's say you're trying to jump over and you see, you, I'm never going to be able to jump that. And you look down the canyon this way, there's nothing for miles. And you look down here the, and there's nothing, but there's one bridge way down there. And you, oh. I gotta walk home. And so you walk down there and you're able to walk all the way across the Grand Canyon on that bridge. That's Jesus Christ. And people say, well, why is there only one way? And I said, at least he gave us a bridge. <laughs> Jesus is that bridge that gets us over a span that we never could otherwise. And the thing that drives our behavior away from him is this idea that I can do it myself. I can live my way. Someone once said that Frank Sinatra's song, I Did It My Way, was going to be the theme song in hell. <laughs> because people want to live their own way. They don't want to surrender. We'll get to that here in point three. Luckily, the Holy Spirit is in us, and he helps us uh, to know God's way and to follow him. Look at point three as we finish today. On my best behavior. We talked about behavior can't save. We look behind. And now what about on my best behavior? So you're a prisoner. You're in jail. What's the best news you could possibly get? You're going to be released early because of good. You got masks on. 
Release because of good behavior. behavior. Good. Your mom says, hey, there's company coming over. Look out. You better be on your best. Behavior. Okay, there you go. Now, what does behavior look like in the Christian life? How do we, uh, you know, boil something out of the Bible that we can actually understand and take with us, you know, in, in, into the week? Because we know self-improvement doesn't work. We talked about that. And the, the Bible does give us the answers. Now, I hope you haven't turned away from 2 Corinthians, because I'm going to go back to chapter 5. And in verse 14, here's a key that I, it just lit me up when I saw this. Verse 14, 2 Corinthians 5. Christ's love controls us. Your version of the NIV may say compels us. It urges us on. Christ's love compels us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life, there's a word canos again, new life, will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they'll live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So we've stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. And so Paul, in the first phrase there, says, Christ's love compels us. He's saying that it, 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 it controls us. Um, you know, that, that, have you ever felt compelled to do something? Or the power of being compelled? The Greek word there is soon echo, which it can be translated uh, compel or control or an urge. But this is God's love as an inner force giving you the urge to do what's right. That's what that means. God's love compels us and it guides us toward doing the right thing. Uh, actually, I, have the, I think the next slide is a definition of, of compulsion. It's a force that prompts somebody to do something. And that's what it's like when we have the Holy Spirit in us. Compel is a pretty strong word, isn't it? <clears throat> and it means that when we open the gate up, the love of God can then flow into our mind and emotions and our will. And opening that gate means that God, God's power will make it easier for us to obey. So let me ask you, what, what compels you? What is it that drives your choices? For a lot of people, it's fear. I want to stay out of hell. I want to get into heaven, so I better do this. And that's fear. Or if I, if I do enough, I'll please God, and I'll get into heaven, so I'll do, do, do. And that's duty. But Paul's saying it's love for God that should compel us. And you might say, well, Mark, where do, where do I get, I don't feel that compulsion of love for God. Where do I get that compelling love? How do I keep that alive? Because see, <clears throat> beliefs come from your mind. But faith comes from your spirit, your human spirit. I think that's on the next slide. And so there's a reminder again that when we keep this gate open, now notice that this, this uh, arrow here is green because it's a green light, it's open. And now instead of fighting God, our mind, emotions, and will are open to him. And when we stay in love with him, Augustine said, love God and do what you please. <laughs> now that's a little, a little vague and maybe a little too far open out there, but I like to think about this way. If I wake up in the morning and I want what God wants, I'm going to be okay in every choice I make. That's what Psalms means when it says, God will give you the desires of your heart. If your desires are the same as his desires, you'd be okay. Problem is, that's where the Civil War comes in. And now we're fighting what we really desire uh, and being honest with God. Anyway, we got to get out of here. But let me give you three points as we finish today. Here's how you keep that compelling love for God close to your heart. First is surrender. Surrender. Uh, a lot of times we're passive aggressive. We say, I love you, God, but uh, we don't really want to follow and obey him. The next slide will show surrender. So we, you can you know, write it down if you want to in your outline. But surrender is important. You don't want to say, I love you, God, and then go about living your old ways which is easy for us to do, right? Luke 6, 46, Jesus himself said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet you don't do what I say? Ouch. We hear verses like that, and it cuts us, because 
We know it's true sometimes. And so surrender means that you have to give in to God and let him, let him be Lord. You know, the Bible is full of paradoxes, isn't it? You want to be the greatest? You got to be the least. You want to be first? You got to be last. You want to be lifted up? You humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. You want to live in Christ? First, the grain of wheat needs to fall into the ground and die. You want to find your life? Jesus said, lose your life to God, and then you'll find it. Yeah, these paradoxes kind of mix us up. So when we hear, I surrender, and then somehow I win, because in the win-win world that we live in, where everybody wants to win all the time, when you surrender, it looks like you're a loser. How can I win if I surrender? In a war, if you surrender, also, you're the loser. <clears throat> But what we do is we surrender to this love that compels us. And when you give into that, then the gate can open up and the love of God can flow into your mind and emotions. And well, you know, we're going to do a, a series on prayer. You need to come to this. And this would be good for you to bring new, new attenders to because we're going to go a lot deeper down into that. And so it's your mind and emotions and will. But to me, it's especially your will. This is a picture of a house that we lived in. It's actually our deck in the back, that we lived in in Fillmore uh, for many years. And <clears throat> this is a levee. They were doing some work. Caltrans was. They were, her Army Corps of Engineers was building this up because it's a floodplain. There's a river out here that runs alongside it. it and it was a, a great view. It was a 180 view going up here. But there, this levee had a walk along the side where there was public walk. And it would go a mile or more down this way and a mile or more down that way. And I would come out in the morning. And I remember from my prayer times, often I would walk and I would just like reach into my pocket and symbolically pull my will out and say, God, just take my will today. What did Jesus say? Not my will, but your will be done. I fear if I could follow what Jesus said, I might get my day started in a good way. You know what? If you start with your will, Forget your emotions and your mind and say, I'm going to give my will, my determination to make choice. Then he'll make it easier <clears throat> for your mind and emotions. I don't know how your prayer life goes or where you start or what special places there is for you to go and to pray. But it's a good start toward behavior because with your will, you're making a conscious choice to say, because I love God, I'm going to obey him. And three times in John 14, Jesus said, if you love me, what? You'll obey me. The proof of, of love comes in obedience. We talked about love when we went through the faith, hope, and love, that little tiny Trinity series that we did. You can look back at that. But <clears throat> surrender here, I think, means I'm not going to fight you, God. I want <clears throat> your way in my life. And so I know that the goodness of God leads me to repentance. And I know that you have good things for me. And your grace can transform me. So I'm giving you my will. And I want to obey you, God, out of love, not out of fear. And that's love compelling. And that way, when you surrender, you win. Because we're overcomers. We have the victory in Christ. And it comes, oddly enough, in these paradoxes, when we surrender. You think more about that this week. Let's go to this next one. I don't have time for more, but point B is stay close. <clears throat> stay close, because salvation is like a bridge. It's not just getting you out of hell and into heaven. It's the beginning of a long walk that's going to go for the rest of your life. So you cross the Grand Canyon on the little bridge, and then you get to a place where you're walking with God. You walk and walk with Him. And He's not just uh, 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 beside us. He, he's in us. We're partakers of His nature, it says in 2 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> I love what St. Benedict said, a great Catholic saint. He said, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ to my right, Christ to my left, Christ 
the salvation of all. So, he's ahead of you when you go into your day. He's behind you. He understands your path. He's protecting you. He's setting up good events for you in the future. And when we stay close to him, we can sense him. So when I'm walking on the levee, I'm thinking, you know, I, I, I can, if I'm close, like in the shadows in this picture, these two people are right next to each other. And if I'm that close to Jesus, I can hear what he's saying to me. I sense him guiding me with his will. And I'm, I'm getting it. But you know, there were times in that levee I was walking and I was trying to catch up to a friend and they're like a half a mile ahead of me. There's Dave, I'm gonna to try to catch him. And I couldn't catch him. And if Dave said something, I never would be able to hear him. He's a half mile ahead. I couldn't even really be sure that he was there. And if you're a half mile behind Jesus in your life, and he's way up there and you're not staying close to him, you're not going to be able to hear him the way someone who's in the Word and at church and has a small job and a small group and is connected to him. That's how you stay close. We've, we've talked about this before, and we're going to talk about it again. You, 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 you can't have that close connection without Jesus Christ. And it has to be a long-term commitment. So I was in DFW. Dallas Airport is coming back from somewhere in the east and speaking or something. And I met this guy in a concourse waiting for planes. And he was my age. And he was planting a church. And we had so many things in common. And we like bonded. And we shared emails and text numbers and phone numbers and all that. We're going to stay close, man. And then I left, got on my plane, went, and the connection went dead. I never called him back. He never called me. <laughs> You can't do that with God. Your relationship with God is not one experience where you say yes to God. It's an ongoing relationship. This is a commitment. And how do you stay close? The Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the people of God. And a small group and a small job are good. Listen, I cannot guarantee you're going to grow as a Christian if you're not part of a small group and a small job. That's how we connect and our roots go down deep. And I know it's stuck with the virus right now, but, but those things are true. Final thing as we finish, see it grow. Because people have said to me, Mark, I, I don't feel that compelling love with God. How do I know if I'm growing? And you know, the answer to that is, is it takes time. It takes time for fruit to grow. And then these are the spiritual fruits that you see on the screen. And when those start to show up in your life, then you'll know you're growing closer to God. The love, the patience. When other people say, you know, I've spent time with him or her. She's just more, there's just more gentleness in her attitude. There's more self-control in the way he lives his life. There, there's more peace, it seems, in his, in his mind. You know what those nine things are? Yes, but they're an attitude. Think about those as your attitude. And God wants to change the, the way you treat other people. And, that sh and those are attitude things that are going to show up in your behavior. They're not just internal thought. They have to be seen to show that. But, but fruit takes time. It takes a long time maybe for these things to grow. So you have to maybe be patient. I had someone come and sit in my office just a few weeks ago and said, <laughs> I'm a different person than I was two years ago because I'm going to this church. That felt good for me to hear that. For all the work Ron and the elders and the other ministries here have done. And he was looking back over two years saying, yeah, it's taken time, but I see some fruit. And so we surrender. We stay close. And we, we watch it grow. Remember that? That feels good when that happens. Is that in you? Is that true in you? You can put your papers and books away now. We're, we're done for the way, for, for the day. But remember that video I showed last week where I was talking about that little dog that ran away and then the, he came back and he got picked up and, and they loved each other and he had come back to God and it was all happy. Kind of like this dog sort of being rescued. Well, you know, let God be that scoop me up, love me kind of God to you. Just take time within this week to 
fall in love with him again. Let that compelling love of God be what drives your behavior. Next week we're going to do the last B, becoming. How do we become a mature Christian? Let's pray. Lord, as we finish today, we, we're all at different places on this path. We're all at different stages of sort of ripeness in the, in the nine, in the fruits of the Spirit. But we thank you, Lord, that your love is what compels us and can, can, can drive our lives. Not a sense of duty or not a sense of fear, but your love. And so challenge us, as God, this, this week to to surrender to you again. And to, to feel your embrace of love around us. And then to take a stand with the behavior that, that we know you want us to show. And we put this request before you today in Jesus' powerful name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.